Cool. Thanks. I need to share my screen. Do you do that one? Cool. All right. So uh, today we're going to talk about how to build a machine learning classifier for predicting spam. And uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to we're, we're going to go through a little bit of code, try to figure out you know what how to, how to build a model, and we're also going to put into production, which I think no one really does. They don't put as much emphasis as they should anymore. Um, so it's mostly like building model quality day. It's not like about, it's not really about that anymore. You have to be able to get your model and then put it in production. And then we're actually going to build something that I'm actually currently working on right now is doing something for spam detection. So a message is spam or, or not spam. So we're going to go through that. So uh, let's kind of go through what is spam. Um, so by definition, it's inappropriate messages that are sent to a large number of recipients. This is one of them that I got not too long ago. Um, so it looks kind of spammy. It's got these weird things. You know, who knows this goes? And of course, spam is spam because why not? Spam is good. Um, so they're classified as unwanted messages, and they usually lead to phishing. So the idea is someone says, "Hey, check this cool product out." You fill out your stuff, blah 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 blah, and then your your information is is taken and used for something else. Um, so that's the big problem with spam. Uh, it's became very popular in the 2000s when everyone had phones and they could start messaging with the little uh, itty bitty phones now. And um, spam varies from region to region. Uh, it's about half in, in phone traffic in, in 2019, so it's huge. And in Asia, it's about 30% of traffic, 30% messages were spam. So it's definitely a big problem. Um, so what does Vonage do? So Vonage has ability so we can do do uh, SMS messages for, for our customers. So they can purchase a short code, which is like a four or five digit number that they can use and send out these messages. They're generally used for marketing, SMS, and 2FA. So these are legit messages that go out. And um, it's not like you can just say, hey, I want a code and we'll say, sure, give it to you, why not? So there's a couple of things you need to um, adhere to. And I've put a link into our documentation on, on what that is. But generally you need to be able to when the user says stop, you need to stop your messages. And when they say, they say help, you need to you know, kind of get them more information about what you're doing. So these uh, samples are taken right from that documentation. The first one's showing you, um, you click on a website, and then if you want to be sent messages, you can get that. And then uh, if when you say help, you'll receive this kind of message. And when you say stop, you'll see this kind of message. Same thing for recurring messages. So you know, weather alerts, anything like that. You can do the same thing. Um, if when you say help, the the SMS will return to you. Contact this and, and more questions about what you're doing, and then opt out. Basically, if you say stop, I don't want this anymore. They they have to be able to return this message and not not uh, give you any more messages. The problem with that is that you know as a user, you can go and you know spend a whole bunch of SMS messages. Um, before I, I saw that um. I the person's name who was doing the session talk on spending like six thousand dollars like a, a month or a week on sms's so they get kind of costly um but you can't if you you know if you have the money you can send them out to everybody and you know whatever you're selling you're trying to sell you can get that um another way to do is they steal short codes which is obviously a big problem so one customer has short code they use it for legitimate messages somebody finds that and takes it over and then they start sending spam messages under that account Problem with that's going to be is that when they when a short code message is, is marked as spam, um, Vonage has to has to say no, you can't use it anymore. It is it is uh, disabled. And the problem with that is going to be that if there was a real customer who's using those messages, they can't use them anymore. So obviously it's a huge problem. Um, so when the SMS gets sent out, we we send it out through the telcos or you know, Verizon, AT and T. We send them out, and then they get um, distributed to the actual users. And you know they have their ways to know if something is spam or not. I think they they have their own fraud detection system as well. And um, as a customer, you are able to mark some messages spam. This is something I didn't know until not that long ago. You can do it on iOS and Android. I have some links in here, which I'll share later, on how to actually do it. You also report to FTC, say the spam. And then something that I had no idea about is you can use short code to, to copy the message and send it to this short code spam, and that will mark that as spam. And when Vonage gets a message, um, when, they, when they see that, okay, something is marked as spam, we have an internal team that's a fraud team that's basically handling this, these kind of things and seeing if these are spams or not. If they are spam, then they then they block that customer. So um, we're going to basically help to solve this problem by building a machine learning model to detect the spam. And 
one thing is when you're doing machine learning model, you need to kind of figure out what the benefits are going to be before you do it. You can't just say, hey, I'm going to build something and why not? Um, so this model is going to be able to prevent the meshes from going out. We'll build a system that before the meshes get sent out, we're going to check that message if it's spam or not. If it's spam, you know, we'll, we'll bring it back. We won't let it go out. We'll have it to an internal team to verify that it is spam or not. And um, this is also going to prevent you know, people stealing these short codes and using it, and it's going to save Vonage money and also the customer money from getting all these messages sent out. So um, we're going to need is a couple of things. You'll need to learn know some Python. Python 3 is fine. Um, access to Google Colab. Um, if you haven't seen Google Colab, it's, it's amazing because it's uh, a thing called Juniper Notebook. Juniper Notebook is a web-based most browser where you can write Python code. I think it does Swift. I know it does Julia. I never use it, so I don't know. <laughs> um, it does all those things. And it's like a REPL where you can write some code and print it out and see results. You can also do Markdown. I've seen people write books on it. There's there, there's a thing called MB Dev, which lets you write a full book. Not not, not, not joking. That's, that's real. So, But Google Colab is a free service that lets you use these things. Um, Google Colab lets you basically spin up a, a an instance that's that's on Google Machines. You can write code, save it. Um, you have access for 12 hours, then it'll, it'll, it'll get killed, and you have to re redo your code. You have access to GPUs and TPUs. GPUs are good for for deep learning models, um, basically for a whole bunch of math. GPUs are better for it, and TPUs are Google's tensor processing units. Basically, they are these are GPUs dedicated to machine learning and deep learning projects. If you want to follow along as well, you'll need a Amazon. You need AWS account because we'll be using EC2. Um, we're doing lambdas, and um, we'll be building an API gateway. Um, if you don't know this, that's okay. Um, you can sign for free service, and if not, you can check it out. I'll have everything, the code as well. And lastly, you need an account to actually do the thing we're going to build for production. So, um, first, let's kind of go over what is a classifier. So, we're going to take a bunch of features, which is each message, and we're and it's going to have a label. The label is going to be spam or ham. So the word ham, that means non-spam messages, and that's legit word. That's what I've seen in every single research on spam detection. It's called ham. I don't know why, but <laughs> it is. So when we see ham, it's just non-spam. Um, we'll be using three libraries for this in, in Python. <clears throat> Scikit-learn, uh, it's a big, um, very, very useful framework for doing machine learning. Uh, there's a bunch of models you can use. You can instantiate, you can train, you can validate. Um, and doing some testing models. So second learns useful for pretty much everything for this stuff. Um, Pandas is a way to basically view a CSV or a conversation like, like a self spreadsheet. We can view that. We can do some, some calculations on those rows and view them. So but we're not going to do too much in it. Joblib is the final framework. It's actually built in to, into Scikit. So all it is, it basically saves these models to a file. They're called pickles. That's just what they are. I don't know why. Um, but, but it's basically a binary file because we're going to save our model locally so we can upload it to EC2 and do, do some training. <clears throat> so um, we'll need to know the probability of messages that either spam or not by using every single word from our database. And the theory is that the message would just spam if it contains words that are associated with spam messages. So let's say in our data set we have buy word. They can say buy this, buy that. And all those messages are in messages that are labeled spam. Our model will be able to say, okay, this where it contains buy or a couple of things and it's like this idea, then we're gonna assume it's gonna be spam. So in our data set, we're gonna take every word and make a guess that the words contain most often that would be spam. <clears throat> so before we train our model, we need to convert this text into a matrix, which is basically a series of numbers. Um, there's two ways to do it. I'm gonna show the, um, the easier way to understand, which is basically using scikit-learn's count vectorizer. I have a notebook that shows how we use it. Um, so it's going to be a stripped down version of it. We'll be doing the same thing in our in our production environments, but let's just kind of see how it, how it goes. So I've got these uh, sample SMSs. Um, so are you home? When are you coming home? Uh, we're going to label those as ham, so regular messages. And these and these two, sign up now, and you won't be with your eyes. We'll make those a spam. And this is the sample message we're going to test to see how we're doing. So count vectorizer, all it really does, it's going to count the number of times that word was in the sentence. Um, so we instantiate the, the function, initialize it, and call fit transform. Fit transform is going to take all those, all those words and basically do a count of all of them. So this is a list of every single word. And we'll use pandas to show it and see how it looks. So this is every single word. 
and these are each message. So we can see that R was in the first message one time, home was in the first message, and so was get and your. Um, so it looks like the third message has is twice. So that's one way to do it. <clears throat> so here's the more complicated part. And this is, I'm trying to do that's not, that's not much math as I have to, but you don't have to learn this, which is really nice too. Um, if you do want to do more, more machine learning, get into more, I suggest going through the math just to have a better understanding of when things go wrong, to be able to you know, uh, debug it. But we're going to use this thing called term frequency inverse document frequency. I know it's a terrible word. Uh, also known as TFIDF, so we're going to using that phrase from now on. Basically, it's going to be a pro like a percentage of from that word between every single word in the the whole database of, of messages. So the formula is going to be the number of times that word I is in the document. Let's say the say I is me the word by, and so it's the number of times I is in a document over the total number of terms so every single word in in our, in our database times the log of the number of documents, so every single, every single message that we have, divided by the number of documents contain the word by. And I have a nice little code to show what that is. So in scikit-learn, you just import tfidf vectorizer. Same thing we did as count vectorizer. Initialize it, call fit transform. Gives you the same thing of messages, but our data set is going to look a little bit different. Um, so it's going to be basically a percentage of each word inside the entire data set. So it's a little more granular and our model to be able to take this and be able to learn from it now. So when we do, when we print out X, which is gonna be the fit transform, it's gonna return a sparse matrix. Okay, what the heck is that? Basically a sparse matrix is a matrix that's mostly full of zeros. Um, the problem is that when we see it like this, it's, all, it's, it's mostly all zeros. So there's a couple here, a couple here. That means that, that word wasn't in every single document. So we'll make it, it sparse make just kind of uh, compresses it. Um, when we do two array on it, it makes it dense. So you'll see two array and you'll see dense. And just making, putting all those zeros where they need to be. Um, so we'll actually do that to train a model. And like I said before, here's how, what, what our models be trained on. So we've got these features and we've done this probability, like the percentage of each word in here. And this is, this is the matrix we need to train our model on. <clears throat> So the last part is going to be the actual function we're going to be using to train a model. So we're using naive Bayes. Basically, it's if you if you use probability before, uh, if you know probability, this is the other formula we're going to need to like look at. We don't need to kind of go through it, but I've tried to kind of go through it in step by step. That's the way I do for formulas because I need to read each one out. So so probability. So this p means probability. Um, the probability of the message is spam, which is A. The given, that means every single word is there, is, is a word. So let's say this word is by, times the probability of any message being spam over the probability of the message, over, of the, uh, the word being the message. And it's called naive because we're assuming that all the, all the words are independent. And this is even a better uh, document that I found. This is even shows even better of what it is. And we're using Gaussian naive base. So what Steve talked about before, I hope you're paying attention. Um, that is a normal distribution. So uh, that's what that is. <clears throat> and now let's go to the code. All right. So I have my notebook. Uh, I'm not going to go through it line by line, but because it's going to be tough for see me scrolling. But I will have this notebook available. Um, you can go to it. You can basically fork it and make your changes. You can run this code right there. And if you just step through it, you'll have it completely running. So let's kind of go through a bunch of it piece by piece. <clears throat> So first, we'll need to gather a data set. And we're going to be using a data set that I found. So it's from this UCI uh, repo. Basically, it's for machine learning, you need a data set to start doing your, doing your modeling and stuff. So this one has going to have 5,574 messages. And then some of them will be classified as, as spam or, or, or non-spam. So this was taken from a Grumble text website. So these are legit messages. And these sites are good too, so they give you information about where these models are from, what they have, and if you need to source them, sometimes you do. Most of the times, if you're using a model for production or something, you need to uh, at least cite who, who's building it. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so that's the that we're going to use. Um, we're going to, on the left, print out the first five messages that we know are ham, so just so we can get a, an idea of what we're doing. And on the on the right, we're going to see messages that are spam. So. This is going to be helpful so to understand what kind of data we're dealing with. We don't want to go into blindly by throw modeling it and calling it a day. We kind of need to 
kind of get a gist of like seeing what's going on, what kind of words we have. So if we look at the one on the left, um, you know, words are misspelled and they kind of seem like you know, people talk to normal people. The one on the right, you know, it's free entry, free message, winner, cast, you know, let's go to game. So um, first part is a download that data set. So we're doing this on the notebook. I just have a screenshot for, for uh, um, visibility. With Juniper Notebooks, you can also run bash scripts. So we're using a wget to download that, that SMS and then unzip it. We're going to use pandas to just view the, the data set. And that's all we're going to do in pandas, this and this other function here, we're going to use it. So we're just going to you know, load, load in that CSV. It's tab separated, so you need to tell what it is. We're going to name our, our, our headers label message. That's what these are. And then one other way of kind of understanding the data, we need to see what kind of message we have. So a value count is a property that lets you get the, the number of values that ham and spam are. So we have 4,800 that are ham and 747 that are spam. Um, unfortunately, it is very biased towards ham messages. This is kind of like what it's going to be in real life anyway. You're not going to get even distribution, which makes sense. More messages that you send and receive are going to be real messages, and this can be a handful of our spam. <clears throat> So this is what I've did, done before, um, just build filtering. So in Pandas, you can do a simple filter. So this says, give me every label that has the word spam. Head means print out the first five. That's what that is. If I just print out spam, I get the entire, mess, the entire list. Same for label, says, uh, give me all the, the la labels that are ham, and then we just do that. That. OK, now the actual model. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use TFIDF uh, vectorize to your message. One thing I didn't mention before, we seem to just split our, um, our data set to training and tests. So usually it's about 80% is training, 20% is tests. And that's usually the rule of thumb. You can make it whatever you like. Um, that's, you know, so that means when we train our model, we're going to use 80% of that data for training. So it's going to be able to uh, you know, look at each sentence, make a prediction, and then that's how it's the model. The testing is, is we're going to figure out our accuracy, so how well the model did. So this test size means 0.2, so it means take 20%. And random state is actually uh, when you randomize something in Python, you, you can give it a number so it always randomizes the same exact thing. So if we didn't have a random state number on here and we randomize, we get a different training set and different test set. So our models may be different. We may get a point or two off and different, but this kind of keeps everything consistent. <clears throat> so um, like we did before, we use the TFID vectorizer. We instantiate, we instantiate it and call it transform. We got our sparse matrix, but our sparse region now is more than four sentences. It is 4,400 4, by 7,700. Uh, so it's huge, massive. Uh, and that's why the sparse region, it's a compressed uh, format. So down here, I've tried to find a word that was in there. It's kind of tough, so I kind of go through a bunch of, of items to find it. So it's basically 0 to 4,456 are all our messages. And here is every single word. Uh, I've only printed out the first five just so. So we see that the word bad was in the fourth message, and it has a very low uh, occurrence rate. <clears throat> OK, so and here's that go see naive base model we're, we're going to train. So don't worry, we don't have to code it ourselves. Secular has the ability to say, OK, initialize it and call it fit. Fit's going to do take the training examples and Try and do for the the test for the um, the labels. So Y train is those those labels. So every um, item in X train is just the message itself. Every Y item is that corresponding label, ham or spam. So that that's that's it. <laughs> we train them all. We can go home. All done. Um, we can do our predictions on our test set and see like wow, it's pretty damn good. We got eighty nine percent. Classification for it just shows a bit more metrics than how our model is. And we'll do another thing to analyze our model. We'll use the confusion matrix. This basically shows how well we did right, like what we got right and what we got wrong. Generally, you want to look at the, the horizontal. So it looks like 866 messages that were ham were actually, the model thought were ham, they actually were ham. And 136 mod messages that the model thought were spam were actually, they actually are spam. And then this means that 11 messages that the model thought were spam were actually ham. And 102 messages where the model thought it was ham, but actually spam. So it got wrong there. And here's where I go over the, the classification port that I showed on, on this screen. So precision means that, like how well the model did. So overall, it's doing well for hams. That kind of makes sense because we have way more than spam. And obviously, it's only about half for here. OK. So the pre precision is going to be our two positives and actuals. So it's going to be here. 
the recall is how well it did over all the results. Basically, kind of judges how well the model did. And accuracy is the one we're going to be using for our metric. Is the true positive and the true negatives combined over its like it's a ratio of how well we how well the model did versus all the other items in the document. <clears throat> so this is good, but there are things we can do to make it go a little better. We can try different models like SVN, linear regression, lasso regression. There's a whole bunch more. Second learn docs show you how to do it. And what's nice too is that if you look up a model, there's those two parameters, fit and predict. Every single model, most of them will have those two functions. So you can instantiate it and do fit and predict. So that's really nice too. Um, one thing we can do, which I'm not going to do, is a thing called cross-validation. I'll go over that and I'll show a nice little sheet of what that does. And what we are going to do is we're going to do a thing called grid shirts. Um, basically, we're going to go through the hyperparameters, which basically parameters of a function, same idea, but they have different values. And we're going to try a whole bunch of them and see how well our model did. So this is um, grid shirts. So Gaussian naive base has this function called var smoothing. Its default is 1e neg 9, so that's 0.0, .0 to the ninth power. Uh, so this is short form. So it's we, we do 1e neg 9, 1e neg 5, and 1e neg 1. Um, so we're going to see how well it does. So it's going to basically train the model and try this one, then train the model again with this one and with this one, and then it's going to give us the best results of how basically how well the model did with what results. So the best results <clears throat> were 0 0.1. So that's not our default. So it means we've done better. And wow, we've got 10% better. And if you even look at confusion matrix, oh, go away. Uh, it looks even better too. So it's getting more hams correctly and more spams correctly. So yeah, all right, good. Uh, so this is something we're not doing now, but we can if you want to make sure your model is good as it says it is. So uh, we're doing cross-validation. So basically, um, for each cross-validation, we'll, we'll train a certain amount of this, and we'll use the rest for testing. And we'll kind of split those up into each one. And then eventually, we'll get through every single one we trained on. And then we'll, we'll calculate the mean, which is the average of all these. And that's going to be a better um, result for our It's going to give us more accurate accuracy, I guess is the word. So it's going to help us out as well. And the final part of this training step is going to be, let's see how well our models do. So I'm going to give it these two messages. So I'm on my way home, and this offers to could be true. We'll transform it using the TF-IDF vectorizer. Oh, we'll, we'll make it a dense matrix, so it's mostly zeros, and then do, and then do predict. And it's going to return off a uh, thing called ham. So that, that did good. Cool. Uh, let's try the next one. This offers to could be true. Do the same thing and spam. So look good. All right. Final part of the model is to save it. So we can use joblib again to save them as pickles. So we're going to save the model and the vectorizer itself. Because when we do any predictions, we need to use the vectorizer. Basically, we need to use the same um, words that the model was trained on to make sure our prediction is the model. If we train it on a word that doesn't it is in there, it's not going to know if it's ham or spam or not. So, so um, let's kind of go over what we've done. We've downloaded our data set from that UCI repository, split A20, 80% training, 20% test. We're using, uh, I can't remember the whole thing, <laughs> TF-IDF matrix to uh, convert those into percentage of each word for every message. Using Gaussian and Naive Bayes model train it. Um, we've got our initial training set of 86%. We used grid charts, we got the 95, 96, we saved our model. So now, this is what we're going to be building. Uh, for the Vonage uh, SMS API. We're going to build a little way that you can text a message to a phone number, and it'll tell you ham or, or, or spam. Um, before that, we're going to be using AWS Lambda to make a function to make the predictions on the message. And we're going to use API Gateway, which is a REST API that can hook into the AWS Lambda. And then we'll be using our, our SMS app to, uh, to show how it all works. Um, so the one thing I wanted to mention before we go further is production. Um, a lot of problems through other companies is that a lot of people do machine learning products, but they don't get to production. Something happens, either like the data is not good enough, um, they're seeing the results are bad, you know, it, it happens everywhere. So um, if you take one thing away, if you do some machine learning data science, you know, always be aware that the, you could be in this 49%, but don't give up. Uh, there's always ways to keep improving your model. And uh, you'll keep going, and eventually, I think you'll you'll do it. But just you got to keep on it. So that's one thing I'm trying to say. <clears throat> so uh, let's go to actually building production. And when I was doing this project, this is where most of my time was. Is to actually get this thing so other people can use. And things we have to deal with, we have to 
figure out scale. We have to know where to deploy this on, how many matches we're going to get, how is it going to do, what we can use. So most of my time was like building this whole pipeline. And I've did uh, things using uh, AWS SageMaker, which is basically a uh, Amazon's way of hosting Juniper notebooks and training and validating. Same thing we showed in, in our notebook, but you can do in AWS. Um, so we've done things like that. But most of the time was getting all this kind of working. And so, but for this example, we're going to have it a Lambda function. And unfortunately, Lambda functions are going to be a little bit tricky, and I'll, I'll show you why. Um, so in order to have a Lambda, um, we need to have the scikit-learn library on it. Problem is, Lambdas do support third parties, but they use this thing called layers, and I don't really get that. So it was you can't just say, here's my model, and you know, you're done. Um, so what we're doing is we're going to use EC2 to basically write our code and then point that, we're going to zip it up and then put that to S3. And then from there, we're going to have um, Lambda look at that S3. And you could do this other ways too. If you, as long as you have a, a, a Linux distro, basically, uh, so you'll have it and you can deploy and run from there. <laughs> so these are screenshots I have on how to do it. Uh, I'm not going to do that manually right now, but you'll create a EC2 instance, set it as micro because we don't need too much. This is on the free tier, so you're good to go. Make sure you have SSH enabled um, because we need to actually go into the box and write a code in there. And then you need to create a role. And that role needs to have two things. It needs to have uh, Lambda access and S3. For production, I wouldn't suggest having full access. You probably only want read access to one of the buckets they're using. Um, so yeah, for, for S3, Lambda, you basically just want to be able to, to run code. And that's what I think is the execution role is what you'd use for that. Um, next, you'll go into create a Lambda function. So this is the only part we need to create our Lambda. We're going to give it a name, runtime, use, ex use the existing role. And if you have a role, great. The role just needs to have a Lambda access in able to run it. So I have one, so do that. And um, you'll need to keep this uh, function name in mind because we're going to use it later. Next, um, you'll do it. So uh, you'll, you'll be getting a, uh, a private key. You'll need to SSH into that, and you'll be on your box. And then this is a couple of things we need to do to get our box ready. So we need to, um, you can run this code just like this. We'll install Python and Git on here. We'll need pip. Pip is going to be our package manager. So we can install third-party third library. We need that. Pip dash has versions to show us that the pip version, make sure we're all good. Um, I will also the code available. I'm going to share that as well of the Lambda function. We're going to cd in that folder. And then this is why, this is why we need EC2, because we need to install scikit-learn. Onto, onto that EC2 instance. What we're going to do is we're going to zip all that code up, the Lambda function and the scikit-learn, and package that for the Lambda. So this is the Lambda function that we're going to use. And it's, um, we're going to use, we're going to get the message from the query string, and the query string is going to be from API Gateway, which we'll, we'll, we'll show. And then we will load the model. So one the ones that we saved from before, load the model in the vectorizer. And then I mentioned that comes in, we're going to do a transform, basically converting it to a dense matrix. Two array means make it make it sparse. So we get all the zeros in there and make predictions. And then the response is going to be the prediction here. We would say 200 and from there. And I also wrote this little bash script that does all the heavy lifting for you. So when you're your EC2 and you're done, you call this bash script. Um, you'll And what's, what the bash script is going to do is going to Basically, CD into Lambda folder. The Lambda folder is going to have the, the Lambda function as well as the scikit-learn libraries. Zip them up in a nice little uh, zip file. And then we're using AWS CLI to upload that to our bucket. So this, we also need an S3 bucket for this. And the final thing is going to update the Lambda. So all this is going to be doing is going to upload, it's going to take our zip file from our bucket and point it to this function. So this function we call that was spam detection th. So then our, our Lambda is updated. So if we ever need to make changes in our Lambda or add new uh, libraries, we just run this, this bash script over and over again, and it will zip. It will um, push to S3. And then Lambda will look at that. They'll tell, you, they'll tell your Lambda function, hey, look at this zip file, and that will be using for your function. And the final part is going to be to building a AWS gateway. This is going to let us do a simple REST API so we can call our our, our, our function, our Lambda function, and we can you know, see responses from that. So this is how to create trigger. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry. 
Okay. So we will create an API gateway. Uh, you'll do this on when you go to your Lambda instance on the left hand side, there's a button that says add trigger. You'll click that. That's what this page is showing. <clears throat> Show the API gateway. And then we'll say, okay, I want this to be REST API. And we'll make this um, open for now, just for demoing. Uh, for production, you should probably use something called IAM or API key to make sure it's, it's secure. And then let's actually try this whole thing out. So what we're going to do is we are going to um, replace uh, basis, uh, blank spaces with percent 20 so we can make this a URL encoded value. We're going to take those same messages we had on my way home and this offer is too good to be true. We are then going to use curl. And what's nice too, this is also in the Jupyter Notebook. We can do it. So we can call curl from there, call my API gateway. And when you create your API gateway, you'll get that URL. You put that in here. And then this is the actual message that we're sending it to. That's the, the get parameter. And we'll get a prediction ham. We'll do the same thing for this message. And then we'll say, and then we'll call that and it says message span. So the final piece, I think a little early, but um, we're going to build our SMS application that allows users to send messages and receive the predictions, basically. The application will be attached to a Vonage phone number, which we'll be able to rent. And whenever somebody sends an SMS to that number, it's going to call API, it's going to be calling API Gateway, passing the message along to it. API Gateway will return the prediction. So um, hopefully you've been able to create uh, a, a Vonage phone number. You can use this number if you'd like to try it out. It's running locally, um, so I'm fine with that. <laughs> and uh, you can you create a number, you do a webhook, and this is actually a locally hosted NGROC. Um, we do have some documentation on what NGROC is and what you'll use it for. Basically, you need to have a way to expose your local your your local uh, ports to the outside world so so Vonage can see it. So when they make a they make a call, they make a uh, callback to your num to your webhook, this is something that needs to be publicly accessible. So that's what Engrock is doing. I also have a, a link to one of our blog posts that shows you how to do it. And this one code, thank you to Diana for um, using the, the skeleton app that I'm actually using for this. So thank you. Um, so this is our Nexmo API application. And I have this code as well. Um, it's in it's forked from Diana's uh, Python skeleton app. So thanks. Uh, so what they're going to do is we need to have our API key in secret, which we'll be getting from from the next one from the next one portal, right of Vonage portal. And then um, you'll need that. And then this is the route we'll be using. We're using Flask because Flask. And then basically we'll be getting the message and the uh, the from number. So that's all this is going to do. This function, whenever somebody SMSs that number. It'll get their the phone number they came from and whatever they sent. There's a bunch more things, but we're not going to uh, we don't have to worry about those. And then we will have another function called get prediction. So get prediction, go away, go away. There you go. So uh, this calls your API gateway URL, and we are using uh, .env's to make sure that we, we don't um, upload our, our keys and secrets when we're doing um, you know get repos. So that's why we're using that. Get the API gateway URL and then pass it the message. And then it'll do it using the request lib to just make a get prediction on it, a get request on it, and then return prediction. So this will be stored into this func into this property here. And then now we'll do an SMS out. So the reason why we need the from numbers is we can send it back to them and we're gonna send them the prediction. And that's all this is doing. If there's an error, we'll or error out, but if not, we'll just do a 200. Okay. So next, since I have so much time, is we're going to go through the Skeleton app. Um, so again, I have all the code in here. And this is what we'll be showing. This is that same code before. So let's go to that. We will clone, clone the repo and then create a virtual environment. Uh, if you don't know what that is, basically we, it's a way for Python to keep all its, any, any third party frameworks, um, basically in their own little bubble, let's say. So if you have different versions of Python and different versions of secular, you know, there could be problems in the machine. So this basically makes it all nice and tidy. So you can't do something, you, you can't use secular on a different library and, and then using Python too or anything like that. Um, pip install requirements is going to be installing those libraries into this virtual environment. We'll then use that .env 
to save our key secret, the number that we're going to be sending messages to, and the gate, a uh, the gate <laughs> API gateway URL. And then finally, we're going to run the Flask app. And then it's going to spam 500. And I have a little video of it. So my phone is here. I'm going to text the message saying I'm on my way home. And then we're going to get all that information back, and we're going to say ham. And then I'm going to do it again for as this goes. Same in it, and do, 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 spam. So we have finally made everything into production. We are ready for this thing to go out into the world. Um, so <laughs> that is that. Um, finally, wanted to give some resources. Um, I have the Google, the, I'll share this link with everybody. The Google Code Lab Notebook, which will have all the code. And since I have some little bit of time, I kind of go through my notebook. And I've also, I'm actually making the blog post soon, I hope. But what's nice is that I can basically just export this out because it's all marked out and I'll have all the code and everything. So it's going to be pretty simple. So um, I have a little blog post. I have a, the notebook that kind of goes through each part of everything. So it shows when we do the, the W gets and all that stuff and how to do the, the, the functions and calling pandas and do all that stuff. And you can run this whenever you like. Um, I can connect. I've got some time. And connect. Initialize this. Now I'm not, now I'm connected to a VM, and then I can do a shift enter, and I've just downloaded it. So we're actually running code on. We're actually doing live demos on on a video, which we shouldn't be doing live demos on. But, and then so I can do this whole thing. But uh, so this is the same thing that we showed before, and then that's that's all that's doing. So I'm going to share that with everybody, so you can like literally build this yourself. And uh, I'm also sharing the the repo code that I have. So this is the the lambda. So in the repo, I'm, gonna, I'm saving the model and the, the model and the vectorizer. Um, when you'll do it, you'll you can upload to the EC2 instance if you like. You can use mine. If you you know find something better, if you do better models, please let me know because there's always ways to do things better. You know, um, you know we could go crazier. We could do deep learning on it where we would basically give it more more learning tricks. So basically, it's going to learn way more. Um, Another thing I can go into is there's something called transfer learning. This is a part of a deep learning model. And for transfer learning, we basically, we have a model that's, that already knows basic English. So um, that model has been trained on, on Wikipedia. And you know, it's like, I don't know, I think it's 100 billion words trained on. So it knows words. And when you put a sentence together, it, it, the model understands what those words, so what those mean. Not just the probability, like the percentage of that word being in in a spam message or not. So we should get better results, um, but there's other ways to make them better. So that's one way to do it. For this, we did a, uh, a simpler machine learning model um, that's not as, um, you know, they should be able to, to get to. And then, oh, one more. No, there you go. I've also linked to a, a video on uh, Bayes' theorem by Three Blue Run Brown. If you haven't seen his work, it's really, really good basically does a lot of math and it does it visually. So it's very nice. Um, and also the Lambda code and our Skeleton app and uh, basically the information on uh, tier and frequency, inverse document frequency. I haven't had it. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that's it. Any other questions? I know I'm early, but. Me, uh... Okay. Um, let's see. So we do have a couple questions out there. Um, from Nathaniel, is seven seven two six a short code specifically for Vonage, or is it like nine one one nine 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 numbers and works for any provider? No, apparently it's not. It's like anybody. It's not. It's not a. It's not a Vonage thing. It's anybody can do this without. It doesn't have to be a, a Vonage thing. This is, I think, from the FTC, so that they have access to. Okay. Um, yeah. Is there a way to train a model in any other language other than English? Uh, yes. You can, if you had data sets that were in French or German, you could do the same thing. Um, and there are other models that have been trained on um, um, on different languages. So translation is one big thing. And uh, use deep learning for that. So like the transfer learning idea, you get a bunch of, of uh, a French text and you can learn from that as well. Okay, cool. 
Um, are there any advantages to using Google Colab over Jupyter Notebooks? They look very similar. They are pretty much the same. Uh, you can use Jupyter Notebooks locally, and those are fine. Um, you can use Jupyter Notebooks even on uh, AWS. So you can spin up a SageMaker notebook. They're using Jupyter Notebooks as well. The reason I'm using Google Colab is so we can share it. So I can share my code and people can see it and, and fork it and do all things like that. And I have access to, to a GPU because I don't have that on a machine, on my, on my machine. And um, that's what's, if you want to use, do some more of uh, some deep learning stuff, uh, if you try and train a model that has lots of layers and is very, um, it's doing lots of calculations, it's, the GPU is going to give up. It's not going to be able to calculate them. GPUs are, 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 more, are more suited for, for that kind of calculations. So Google Colab gives it to you for, for free. And um, you can spin up different instances. SageMaker has different um, sizes. So you can get like, uh, I think, K100, which are good ones. You can get NVIDIA GPUs. And basically, the more, the better the GPU is, the more you're going to spend. So maybe like a buck or two an hour. So if you're doing all your training on, on that, it can get costly. So I just use Google Colab. If I'm trying out something, uh, and then I know that it's going to die after 12 hours, but I'll just have to rerun the code over again. So. Okay. Um, are there any non-Python alternatives to doing machine language learning? Um, yeah. So Steve had his thing in, in .NET, so you can do that. Um, that's one I know of. Uh, TensorFlow supports JavaScript. So you, if you had a model, and I think there is a library for training models using JavaScript. I don't know. I've, I've seen that. Um, also you can do in Swift now. So Swift is, that's coming up. Uh, that library is still in super, super beta, but you, if you know, if you know IS Swift for, for building iOS apps, you can build a machine learning model. And those are actually supported on Google Colab as well. So, um, Chris Latner was used to be at X Apple, X Google, now some other company. He was the one that kind of, um, helped us out for TensorFlow. So you can, build a model in Swift using TensorFlow, and you use the same uh, Swift-style um, syntax that you can build something. Okay, and Steve Lorello mentioned uh, just a second ago that there is a TensorFlow library for .NET, so <laughs> TensorFlow has a lot of different uh, underpinnings underneath it. Yeah. It's... Um, go ahead. And I'll say, so yeah, TensorFlow is for more like you know deep learning stuff. Uh, I it, It's always a problem for me to um, kind of get through it, but I'm like more, I'm, I'm more comfortable with PyTorch, and I can actually talk about it because I think I have some time. I don't know if I do. Am I, am I over? Or am I <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're cutting pretty, pretty close. Okay, so. cool. Okay, I won't. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so Google Colab, yeah. So Google Colab has the same uh, thing as SageMaker. I, think, I forgot what it's called, but you can spin up a Google Cloud instance that has uh, Juniper Nobis installed, get access to GPUs, configure um, your hard drive, you can figure out how much RAM you want, how many uh, GPUs you want in there as well. Okay. So, oh. yeah, you can do that. Cool. So I'm going to assume that answers the, uh, does, is it doable with Google Cloud? question yep, as well totally. so okay uh so thank you tony very much uh i know i've told you this before but this is one of my favorite machine learning talks thank uh you. it's super easy to follow and i i love it uh for the way i learned so um Great. thank you for that uh it